This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly acclaimed, multi-award winning actress, filmmaker, and world-renowned acting coach. On the stage, she starred in over 30 plays and musicals, including Tennessee Williams' The Rose Tattoo, House of Yes, Bright Ideas, Ibsen's Ghosts, and One White Crow. She's also directed many award-winning stage productions, including The Night of the Black Cat, Mental, the musical, You're on the Air, and Jane Fonda in the Court of Public Opinion. On the big screen, she's appeared in several movies by other directors, including Reach and Ovation, as well as in many of her own movies, including How to Go Out on a Date in Queens, Hello, Herman, The Bandit Hound, Bad Impulse, and The Runner. Her movies have won a staggering 56 awards at some of the most prestigious film festivals in the world. And she's here today to discuss her latest film entitled Miranda's Victim, which in my opinion is an absolute masterpiece. The movie tells the true story of the origins of the Miranda warning, which the police must give to every criminal suspect and accused person that they have the right to remain silent and that anything they say can be used against them in a court of law. Until our guest made this movie, most people had no idea about the circumstances behind the landmark 1996 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in the Miranda case. Circumstances involving the horrific kidnapping and rape by Mr. Miranda of Patricia Weir in Phoenix, Arizona in 1963. This riveting movie starring Abigail Breslin, Andy Garcia, Donald Sutherland, Luke Wilson, Ryan Felipe, and Kyle MacLachlan tells the jaw-dropping story of the many astonishing twists and turns throughout the groundbreaking court case from the perspective of Miss Weir, the victim. Here's the trailer. Watch this. Mr. Miranda. A girl was grabbed on 7th Street on Saturday night, right around the same time that you got out of work. Can you describe the man? Number one looks like him. Tell me everything. And don't leave anything out. I'm testifying. Are you sure about this? All rise. I don't want to see you become damaged goods. It's not just for me. The prosecution calls Patricia Ann Shumway. What about the next girl? I promise I'm going to put this guy in jail for a long time. The jury has found you guilty as charged. Hello, Ernest. John Flynn. Can you get me out of here? I believe I can. Aren't you gonna ask me if I'm guilty? I'm far more interested in why you signed that confession. I know what you're trying to do. A man's as guilty as sin. The issue is whether this defendant's confession should have been allowed in evidence. It was coercion, plain and simple. There was not an attorney present. Don't make him the face of your crusade. What about Miranda's victim? I really don't care. Objection, Your Honor. Your Honor, you must stop this. You must stop this now. The cases before us raise questions. What if they say he's not guilty? The Supreme Court might make us retry him. The whole world wants nothing but to take from us. Miranda did not request counsel. Therefore, we reverse. And being locked away is the only thing that lets me sleep at night. this over and over. She's worked so hard. She's doing what's right. Mr. Miranda, our justice system has afforded you every privilege, every protection. Hey! This is a courtesy not extended to your victim. The movie, which is available for streaming on Hulu, has won 15 film festival awards and has been universally praised not only by film critics, but also by leading members of the legal profession and justice system. In addition to being a highly acclaimed stage director and filmmaker, our guest is also a renowned acting coach. She's given acting workshops around the world, and she's worked with many A-list actors, including Donald Sutherland, Henry Cavill, 
Gerard Butler, Penelope Cruz, Andy Garcia, Salma Hayek, and many others. She teaches acting classes at the Michelle Danner Studio and the Los Angeles Acting Conservatory. She's also the founding director of the Creative Center for the Arts, where she has served as artistic director for more than 20 years. I'm delighted to welcome Michelle Danner to our show. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Michelle, this film is near and dear to my heart because, as you may know, I'm a retired criminal court judge. Did you know that? I did not know that. I consider your film to be an extraordinarily important movie, not just in terms of great storytelling, but as a very effective instrument of public legal education. Congratulations, Michelle. The movie is absolutely superb. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Tell me what drew you to this story. Well, I immediately realized when it was offered to me that the that story, nobody knew what that story was. In my previous movie before that called The Runner, in the first scene, I had a scene where the police officer arrests a young kid for selling drugs and he reads him his Miranda rights. And I never questioned where, where did the Miranda rights come from? So that is because the the survivor, the person that it happened to, kept it private for almost 60 years. As a matter of fact, last year was the 60th year anniversary of when it happened. And uh, so that is the reason why we didn't know the story. But, uh, but now we do because we made the movie. Well, as you've just mentioned, it's been 60 years. And finally, the victim in this case allowed her story to be told. Do you know what inspired her to do that? Well, George Colbert, who is the person that w thought of the story, he asked the question, what happened to the survivor? How did this come about? And he sought her out and he asked her if she would allow her story to be told. It took a little persuading because, like I said, she kept it private all these years, even from her family most of the time. But finally, you know, he was able to persuade her that she would be contributing something by telling this story. It's a gap in our history because we really did not know exactly what happened. And so from talking to her, from interviews, from court transcripts, he was able to write the story and then en enlisted, you know, some other screenwriters that helped as well, Richard Lasser and Craig Stiles. But uh, he is the one, he was really the originator. He's the one that had the idea. There are so many important messages and themes, Michelle, that come through in this movie. For example, the doctor who examined Trish at the hospital when she reported the attack was very insensitive and condescending. I sure hope things have improved for victims of crime when they're being medically examined nowadays, don't you? Well, we can only hope, right? But I'm sure that... Somewhere in the world, even now, 60 years later, there are sadly, you know, very compassionate doctors and sadly, very non-compassionate <laughs> doctors. They just pride themselves on doing their job and keep it very clinical, which is what makes it very cold and inhuman. And so somebody that underwent a sexual assault has to, in a way, you know, be abused again because, you know, there's not enough compassion when at that stage. Another theme that came through loud and clear was the way in which society, including family members, treat sexual assault victims. Trisha's mother did not want the police involved because she was more concerned about her daughter's reputation than seeking justice. At one point, she says that she doesn't want her daughter to be seen as damaged goods, that was a really heartbreaking scene, and I thought you directed it beautifully. Thank you. Well, you know, the the secret that is revealed in that scene is, of course, you know, a secret that a lot of women hold is that she also underwent a sexual assault. And so she reveals that in that scene. And so she comes from experience, even though she's not giving the best advice to her daughter, she's giving the advice that comes from a place of a mother who loves her child. And, and she wants to protect her child, first and foremost. That's what she's all about. But of course, you know, she's not guiding her in the direction of seeking justice and speaking the truth. 
because she's driven by shame instead of by justice. And the other family member who really comes across very badly in the film is Trisha's husband, who was horribly insensitive, unsupportive, even abusive. He actually says to her, I wouldn't have bought the cow if I knew I could get the milk for free. The police tell him his wife is a hero. Michelle, I really hope the movie will help change people's attitudes about rape, because I think some of those attitudes still exist out there. Yes, I mean, I think that unfortunately, the problem has not been solved. If anything, it's very hard for women to come forth with a story of assault, sexual assault, abuse, sexual abuse, because there's so much that's attached to it. It's layers of complexity, there's shame, and there's terror. And, you know, and then people they don't believe you. It's it's one's word against the other. So there's a lot that's attached to it. It's not it's not so clear. It's not black and white. That's right. And I found that this movie really effectively explores the reality that very few rape victims, even today, have the courage to come forward and report it to the police. There's a scene in the movie where the police detective says, nine times out of 10, no one believes the victim. Why do you think that is? Well, I think that, you know, that there's no witnesses. So it's, you know, one word against the other word. It's he said, she said. Well, and as a so, former criminal court judge, I can tell you that sexual assault cases almost always have no witnesses. You're 100% right. It is basically his word against hers. And given the presumption of innocence and the burden of proof, which is proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is a very high standard of proof, then it stands to reason that if an accused person can raise a doubt about whether the offense occurred or whether the victim was consenting to the sexual act, then he has to be found not guilty. And that's the reason so few sexual assault charges result in a conviction. In fact, in the United States, for every 1,000 sexual assault charges, only five cases end in a conviction. That's very daunting for victims, isn't it? I can tell you that having toured the festival circuit, so we opened this movie last year in, um, well, was it last year? Yeah, it was last year, <laughs> you know time just goes. In Santa Barbara, we were the opening night movie at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. And then we went on a historical theater called the Arlington Theater. Then we went to Gasparilla to play the Tampa Theater there. We went to uh, San Jose to play the California Theater. We were in Avalon, the Avalon Theater in Catalina. So we played all these historical theaters, which was really interesting because this is a historical story. And there's a postscript at the end of the movie that shows up, which is that only 5%, like you said, for every 1,000, 5% get convicted. And there's always been a, not a notable gasp in the audience. Like people don't know this statistic. They don't understand that though that's, that's what it is, that people come forth. A lot of them don't come forth. There's so many more stories. That's one of the things that I really became clear is that there are many more stories of, uh, you know, downright, obviously, sexual rape, abuse, even molestation, which goes under sexual assault, you know? As a matter of fact, I had an epiphany myself. I was doing one of these interviews months ago, and I was, I started to remember that I had something happen to me when I was a teenager, but I swept it under the carpet. I chose not to remember it. I chose not to, you know, deal with it. And it just came up. And what I was so aware of speaking to so many women across the country when we were doing the festival circuit, the screenings, is that there's so many more stories than we know. And so that, that, that 5%, I think, is very, very real. Well, Michelle, I'm so very sorry to hear that you endured uh, abuse. And, uh, and I hope you're doing OK. Yes. No, I mean, it was a molestation. But I chose not to remember it. And I said, well, you know, you, you should think that you're also a victim because it also did happen to you. And I haven't wanted to deal with it. It did happen to somebody very close to me, which I think is partly what really connected me to the story. Well, you know, I don't think the police come across very well in the movie, given that they bungled Mr. Miranda's confession. They weren't particularly supportive to Trish when she first reported the crime. Were you as the director 
making a statement about the police in this film? No, no, there was no statement. We just reported the facts the way they were. But they, they, however, Detective Cooley, who died not too long ago, did try to help. I mean, at first, I think what we documented was the skepticism of the detectives, right? That there's always skepticism, but ultimately they were also after justice, these particular detectives. They wanted to catch the rapist because what's at stake is that this person that's out in the loose is going to go rape other people and they had to get him off the streets. So they certainly had an incentive to to find out who it was. So, you know, I went to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I walked the trajectory of that night on March 3rd, 19, you know, 63, where she worked at the Paramount Theater and she took the bus and I went to the bus stop and I get very emotional. I thought, well, if she had not taken that bus, if she had taken an earlier bus, it wouldn't have not been her. It would have been somebody else. You know, I, I, I drove to the desert. I went to the courthouse, the Maricopa court, courthouse, where he was indicted. And there's a museum that has all of Miranda's, you know, articles. And I went to the house where he was arrested. I went to the house where Trish grew up. I went back to the bus stop. I started to cry. I mean, I really felt. But I thought to myself, it had to be her. Because if it was somebody else, they may have not had, you know, the, the courage, maybe, to stand up for it and fight for justice. But even though at the beginning she was encountered by skepticism and the only person that stood by her was her sister, it's really good to know that justice ended up prevailing. Oh, yes. Now, for the benefit of our viewers who may not have yet seen the movie, the legal issue in the Miranda case was the admissibility of Mr. Miranda's confession to the police. He said that he was tricked and intimidated by the police into confessing his guilt, and therefore his confession was not voluntarily given. The Supreme Court agreed with him and ruled that his confession was inadmissible. A new trial was ordered where the confession could not be relied upon, and Mr. Miranda was still convicted. My question to you, Michelle, is this. What do you think the movie will make people feel about the justice system? Well, that sometimes it can really work. <laughs> I mean, not not with the Supreme Court having overturned it. That, no. But what's interesting is that, you know, there's rights. You know, there's rights for the the guilty and there's rights for the innocent. You know, whether, you know, that there is civil rights liberties, that there are protections in place, whether you're guilty, whether you're innocent. I mean, ultimately, you know, what you want to know is that if somebody is guilty, they, you know, there's justice at the end. But I think there was justice for him, but then he didn't do the whole the whole time. He got out early. But then, and this is why I really wanted to tell the story till the very end, you know, because a lot of people said, well, you know, the story ends when she gets the conviction and she walks out of the courthouse and that's the end. I said, no, 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 it comes full circle. There's karmic justice this thing that happened to his finger. And there was so much about the finger versus, you know, the penis and the transcripts. The fact that the guard chopped off his finger was absolutely a metaphor. I mean, it was obviously phallic, you know, and and that, you know, karma is a bitch. There's karmic justice after all. And that's how it all came full circle, especially knowing that when he met his demise in that city bar on a Saturday night, the same night, that he abducted her, it was a Saturday night, he, you know, that the, the, the man that killed him was read his Miranda rights and get away with it. So if, if karma is not, I don't know if I can say this on your interview, if karma is not a bitch, I don't know what is. Oh no, karma's a bitch. And that particular <laughs> denouement is really, it gives the film a spiritual component, I think. And I I was very intrigued by how the defense attorney was portrayed in the movie. There's a key scene in the movie where the prosecutor asks the defense lawyer, what about Miranda's victim? And the defense lawyer says, I really don't care. Do you think that was a fair depiction of defense counsel? Yeah, well, you know, John Flynn is the one that said that line. It's almost like, you know, My dear, I don't really give a damn. (laughs) It had that in it. He, you know, he was working for DACLU. They had hired him. He was one of the top attorneys, the flashiest attorney, a big star. 
a big, uh, you know, the, the big rock and roll star of his generation. And, and he was used to winning. So he went on after this to win many, many times. And he sadly, you know, suffered an early death because he was um, someone that uh, lived on the fast lane of life. But that's right. I mean, he, you know, attorneys don't ask the, the people that they defend whether they're guilty or not. Although this one did at some point in the movie. Well, I think it's worth pointing out that it's not the defense attorney's job to care about the victim's rights. It's the defense attorney's job to raise every possible defense and put the prosecution to the strict proof of the crime beyond a reasonable doubt. Our whole system of justice and the presumption of innocence depends on defense lawyers doing that job. Have you received any feedback from criminal defense lawyers about the movie? The overwhelming response, the overwhelming positive response from the movie, including from lawyers, from judges, uh, from prosecutors, has been so incredibly positive, which really made me very happy. And then, you know, we got, there was one review, I don't really care about the reviews, they're good, they're bad, they would have been predominantly very good. There was one that I cared about, <laughs> and it was Leonard Malton. Because I feel like he's the last one standing, you know, and he gave it a really good review. And so I don't think I can say anymore, I don't care about reviews, because I did care about his review. Well, as a person who was steeped in a courtroom for 40 years prior to launching this show, I can give you a review and tell you that I thought it was really magnificent. And it seems to me that the greatest challenge for you in telling this story was to find a balance between the rights of victims and their need for justice versus the right of an accused not to be oppressed or coerced or tricked by the police into confessing their crimes. How did you manage to strike that balance so that everybody's perspectives were very fairly conveyed to the audience? Yes, I mean, I think that I didn't want to take a stance. I just wanted to tell the story. And because the story had never been told, I didn't feel compelled to take an approach that was stylized, which would have slanted maybe the points of views. You know, I really felt I wanted to tell it the classic way. I just wanted to stick to the facts and, uh, and tell it as truthfully as I could possibly tell it. Well, the courtroom scenes in the movie were very realistic, especially the examination in chief and cross-examination of the witnesses. Was that dialogue taken from actual court transcripts? Absolutely. And then, of course, some of it was tweaked, you know, for dramatic effect. But yes, it was taken from the, from the transcripts, absolutely, the court transcripts. I have to point out Donald Sutherland's phenomenal and superb performance as the judge at the retrial. At one point, he tells the lawyers to behave themselves. What was it like directing him? It was one of the highlights of my life. Donald Sutherland has always reminded me of my father. And so when he said yes, that he would do it, I'll, also I took it as a sign my father is no longer on this earth. But because, like I said, he just, in, in ordinary people and so many things that he did, he was like, you know, like a, I felt like a father to me. I took it as a sign that my father was an angel watching over this and making sure that it went well. He was great. I had a great relationship with Donald. He wanted me to tell him things, and I told him things. And, and we had a great communication, a great sense of humor. He loved the script. He loved the movie. And uh, what can I say? You know, he's a legend. Well, you did a terrific job directing him. It's one of his most wonderful performances. And like I said, as a judge myself, I totally resonated with his delivery. You made some very interesting stylistic decisions in the movie. For example, your choice of music. You played My Guy, and at one point you played You Don't Own Me. Those were subtle but very effective ways of conveying key messages to the audience, and I really appreciated that, Michelle. Thank you. Well, the music was very well thought out. You know, uh, I have a, a son who is a, a writer and a filmmaker. He's graduating from USC in a couple of months. And he uh, helped with that. He helped with the choices of the music. 
Now, you don't own me. You should know that we re-recorded it. And Abigail Breslin, who plays Trish, is singing it as she walks into the courthouse for the second trial. It's her voice. She has a beautiful voice and she sings it. Yes. That's so cool. There's a scene in your movie that takes place in a movie theater. And we see a brief clip from To Kill a Mockingbird, which is perhaps one of the greatest films ever made about our criminal justice system. What were you saying to us by including a clip from that classic yeah. movie? So that wasn't in the original script. And uh, I had the idea of adding that. And my son, again, helped me to pick the perfect clip that would fit in. But it was a foreshadowing, obviously, for you know justice that was about to happen. Well, Michelle, I truly believe that Miranda's victims should be mandatory viewing for law students, police officers, lawyers, and judges. Congratulations again on the great success of your movie. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Our guest has been the renowned actress, filmmaker, and acting coach, Michelle Danner. You can watch her latest film, Miranda's Victim, by streaming it on Hulu. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.